I must break you. So, this horse by now is very, very dead, but its corpse is too big for me to move, so I may as well keep beating it. Light Lark was a book series that came out last year, and it was a massive success. Sort of. Like, it, uh, it sold a lot, it blew up a lot, but a large part of that was just people hating it, and a lot of the people hated it because it didn't pander th to them correctly, but also it is a pretty bad book on its own. That and the author really did not take criticism well. <laughs> like, at all. She responded remarkably poorly to it. But when the first book came out, I did a regular review on it because I figured whatever the drama is surrounding it, it does deserve a fair shake. And the verdict was that, yeah, Light Lark is a bad book, but mostly it's just incoherent, you know? Like, most of the stuff in there just doesn't make sense. Like, there's other people who made multi-hour long videos about this. Go check those out if you want more info and you aren't familiar with Light Lark. But mostly, yeah, it's just stupid and incoherent, and it's a mess of random tropes that don't fit together, and there's zero in-universe justification for them. And because it's young adult fantasy, it really is just isekai, but it's aimed at young girls instead of young boys. Like, that, that really is what it is, because it's a total self-insert main character. The world is set up to do nothing except make the main character look as cool as possible. The story of Light Lark has zero structure, and it's just, it's just a mess, you know? The second book, Nightbane, just came out recently, and there hasn't been much discussion or fanfare about it so far. Like, months ago when they announced it, and they announced the release date, there was a little bit of talk about it, but since it came out, which at the time of filming it's been like two weeks now, and I've seen very little people, very few people talk about it, very little discussion of it, so I figured, eh, let's, let's see what's in here. And I can confidently tell you after finishing that Nightbane is not good, like, <laughs> at all. Uh, I can't say it's really worse than the first book, but I can, I can say that it seems as if none of the criticism or feedback that Alex Astor got was listened to, like, or none of it landed. Like, this is exactly the same as the first book, and it feels like there was zero effort to improve here, which is kind of annoying, to be frank. There's also several really, really dumb plot twists in here, but, you know, we'll get to those later. I will say that at least there's a map in this one, because the first book didn't have a map, I don't believe, so I, I personally had trouble figuring out where everything is in relation to everything else, and this one had that and fixed it, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and I will say the cover is also pretty cool, because like this one has a crown on the cover, but it's also an island in, in the shape of a crown. It's, it's cool looking. I liked it. And while I was reading, I kept thinking of ways to roast the book. You know, I kept thinking of ways to go, okay, here's how I'll make fun of this, here's how I'll make fun of that. But I was basically just reciting the entire plot when I did that, so I guess I'll do that now. Yeah, I'm gonna recite the entire plot of Nightbane and go over all the problems with it as we go. And that also works out for all the people who are curious about this book but don't want to go to the trouble of reading it. So, y yeah, you're, you're welcome, I guess. Uh, spoilers ahead, obviously. No, God! No, God, please, no! So from the very first line, Nightbane is not good. Isla Crown tasted death on the back of her tongue. That is dumb. Also, yes, people were telling me that the main character's name is pronounced Isla, but I don't really care. I'm gonna say Isla. I don't respect her enough to say her name properly. Now, if you remember the first book, at the very end of it, there was a magical door that Isla was about to open, and the book ends with her about to open it, and then this book starts with her about to open it, and then she opens it partway, and she feels some power, and she hears the voice of Grimm coming through, Grimm being the guy that she was in love with, but also kind of betrayed her in the first book, and then the door is mysteriously slammed shut. So the mystery remains. We didn't actually find out what was in it, which is not how cliffhangers are supposed to work. And I, I might as well tell you now, we only open that book and learn what's in it near the very end of the book. Or excuse me, we only open that door and find out what's in it near the very end of the book. And I gotta say, the phrase filler is thrown around a lot nowadays, like way more often than it should be. It is thrown around a lot. But Nightbane is entirely filler. I am not joking when I say that in the slightest. It is 100% filler because it's literally just a slow drip of information that the audience needs to know in order to understand what's happening. And then there's a battle at the end. 
because Isla has selective amnesia that selectively goes away one chapter at a time, giving us little bits of, inf of exposition about stuff that Isla should already know. I swear to God, amnesia has been a disaster for literary canon. It is just one of the worst ideas that writers can use most of the time. I swear to God, I hate it so much. So after the door throws Isla out and we don't know what's inside, even though the cliffhanger of the last book was, hey, we're about to find out what's inside, we, we don't get to find out what's inside, uh, Oro, who is the king of Lightlark, and Isla is also in love with him, uh, he says that she can only enter the vault door if she masters her wildling powers. And remember, wildling is the realm that she's from, that she's the ruler of. Now, how does Oro know that the vault will only open if she masters her wildling powers? Because he doesn't know much about this either. Unimportant, I guess. He just knows it. Now, he also offers to teach her how to control and use her powers. How does he know how to do that? Because he doesn't have wildling powers? Unimportant, I guess. Now remember, in the first book we learned that Isla's father was a nightshade, so she also has nightshade powers, and at the end of the last book she killed Aurora, who's the leader of the Starlings, the ruler of the Starlings, as they put it, uh, and now Isla also has starling powers. And also she's the queen, queen of the wildlings and the starlings. There's a big party to celebrate the curses being lifted because Everyone wants to talk about how awesome Isla is and how she saved them and how she's just the best, but she is also, like I said, a nightshade, and they would hate her if they found out that she was a nightshade, which means that she gets to be horribly persecuted and put upon and misunderstood and abused while also being effortlessly powerful and wealthy. Look, if you're gonna do those, do one or the other. Either have the MC be super powerful and wealthy for no reason and for with no effort, or have them be hated for something that everyone just hates them for, even though it's not really fair. And if you're going to have somebody, or excuse me, if you're going to have society hate them, rather than having them be hated for something that they are, have them be hated for something that they did. A good example of this is a movie that came out a while ago called No One Will Save You. Like, the main character of that movie is really hated by everyone in her town, and near the end of the movie we find out it's because when she was a kid, she killed one of her friends and it, obviously it's a horrible thing, but she was a child and it was an accident, so, like, there's some moral gray area here, is what I'm saying, as opposed to just having it be pure wish fulfillment, look at them, they're put upon. Now, King Oro says that maybe Grimm and the other Nightshades are going to attack, so he go is going to prepare the army. And there's also a Moonling, who is named Sorin, and he asked asks Isla some questions about wildlings that she doesn't know the answers to. Questions that a ruler really should know, like, how many of them are there? Do they have enough food and shelter? <laughs> like, Isla is in charge of these people, and she doesn't know these things. Like, she has two realms that she has to look after now, and she doesn't know this. She's a really shitty ruler, I gotta say. Now, she also realizes how that she needs to make an heir ASAP, because she doesn't have an heir, and if she dies, without having produced one, then her entire uh, realms will die, like both the starlings and the wildlings. Like, that's been a thing since the first book. I don't blame you if you didn't forget it. And also, this thing about her needing to create an heir never comes back. In fact, I kind of forgot about it until I was going over my notes for this video. Like, I just, I just forgot, oh yeah, uh, that she needed to make an heir, but it just wasn't a thing. Something about Lightlark causes everything in it to just slip out of my mind immediately after I read it. Like, just immediately it's gone. Which is why I took copious notes while I was reading this time, so I could actually go through and do a proper summary for you. Isla gets coronated without much fanfare. It just, it just sort of happens. And then, this big crack appears in the ground, and a bunch of flying monsters come out of it and start attacking people. And Isla tries to help them, but her powers just don't work very well. And once they manage to beat off the attackers, people are angry with her, and they blame her for the attack because the protagonist must be oppressed. It doesn't make any sense for Isla to bring an attack there, but she's blamed for it. And also the creatures that attack are these, like, dragon-like things. They're called Drex, which is a weird name. Now, the ruler of the Moonlings, a woman named Cleo, says that she is leaving and her realm is not siding with Lightlark. Like, essentially, they are declaring independence and they're going to side with the Nightshades, because again, the Nightshades might be attacking soon. Now, during the night, some rebels try to kill Isla, 
They use the ocean to pull her from her room and into some underground tunnels, and then they attack her. But she manages to use her powers, even though she couldn't really use them before, and then she runs away. And this assassination thing doesn't really come back again, but it, it does happen. Now, a nightshade man named Remlar does try to separate Isla's wildling powers from her nightshade powers. Like, because she inherited both, they're like mixed together in weird ways, and that's probably what's preventing her from using them properly. Now, while this is happening, she passes out and she flashes back to when she met Grimm. Apparently, she just accidentally teleported over to the nightshade island where he was, because let's not forget, she also has a magical teleporting stick, which nobody else has. <laughs> she just has had that since before the first book even begins. She, she, just, she just has that. And that's also how she met Grimm. And in the present, she passes out, and then when she wakes up, her powers work. She doesn't have great control over them, but they, they work. And then she's sick for a couple of days after this, and she speaks to Oro, and we get one of the few good lines in the book. She nodded, and it didn't do anything to make her head feel better. Before she could respond, she added, Do you wish I wasn't everything I am? He was quiet for a moment. Her eyes slowly began to close, suddenly heavy. Fighting against sleep was useless in this state. No, Isla, he finally said. It's the part you don't seem to like about yourself that I love the most. Like, come on, that's a cute line. Now, Isla is still really bad at actually using her powers, like I said earlier, but she can use them. Like, she tries to move pebbles using telepathy, which is her starling power, but she can't really do much with them. And so she decides to go train in the Wildling New Land, which I straight up don't remember if the New Lands were even in the first book, but they're in this one. It's like other islands that are a little farther out that people from various realms went to and have started colonizing. While she goes to train, she brings some of her friends along, and the wildlings tell her that Isla needs to bond with an animal, and the way to bond with one is to shoot it with an arrow. O okay, sure, whatever, it's magic. Now, while she's out looking for an animal to bond with, she gets attacked by a bear, and this bear has horns. I don't know if that's an important detail, but I felt the need to mention it. Like, bears just, I guess, have horns in this world. That's a thing. And uh, while it chases her, she manages to throw it out of a tree, and then this black leopard appears, and it seems really friendly, and then it allows her to stab it with an arrow, and now they're bonded. And she jumps on the back of this black leopard and rides back to her friends, and the others are shocked and they recognize it, because apparently his name is Lynx, and he was bonded to her mother. Naming a leopard Lynx is kind of like naming a dog Dachshund, but whatever. That, that's a thing that happens. Then Isla goes to Starling Isle because things are pretty bad there. And it, I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Like, the book seems to say that there's only a hundred Starlings left. I, I think it's kind of unclear. The way it's written is very strange. I don't know, but like, sure, there's only a hundred Starlings left. And then we go to a flashback. And actually the rest of the book from this point forward is kind of one chapter present, one chapter flashback. It's very obnoxious, and I'll get into more detail later. But in the flashback, she duels Grimm, and then she loses, and then he throws her out of his realm. And the flashbacks only happen a little bit at a time because Isla only remembers a little bit at a time. Like, there's a bunch of chapters that end with, oh, this event reminded Isla of something that she had forgotten before, and now that it's, now it's back. And remember, this entire book is just exposition. Like, that's all that's there. And if... All this information that, again, Isla really should know, uh, if all of this was given to the audience at once, it would be like 30 pages long, and it just there wouldn't be a book, because that's all that there is. Now, in the present, Isla takes a shower in her room. I don't know how that's possible. Again, this is like a medieval castle, and I get that there's magic, but I, I don't know, I feel like this book is so allergic to making the protagonist work or suffer for anything that she gets to have hot running water in a medieval castle. Like, that's... That's the only reason I can think of for why this is even a thing. It's so stupid. So her and Oro are hanging out still, and he's like avoiding her touch, and she asks if he's not attracted to her, and he says, no, I totally am, and then he gets a boner, and then they have sex, and then they keep having sex a whole bunch. It, it happens. And finally, something happens, because Grimm actually sends out a warning to the island of Lightlark. He says, everyone vacate the island within 30 days, because he's going to destroy it. And then the moonlings again join the, with the nightshades because they don't want to die alongside everyone else. And if Isla wants to stop Grimm from destroying Lightlark, she has to remember her time with him. At least 
according to the oracle she speaks to, the oracle might have been in the first book. She might not have been. I don't remember. And I'm not going to check. And honestly, the fact that there's prophecies in these books means nothing. The prophecies make no sense. It's literally just excuses for the plot to happen. Basically, without Isla and her memories and her being so special, everyone will die. And so the more she masters her powers, the more she will remember. Which, um, I guess that does make some kind of sense, but it's still not a great way to structure your story. So we go into a flashback where Isla is wandering a bazaar. There's a stand there that sells human teeth. That doesn't lead anywhere, but I felt the need to mention it. And there's another stall that Isla makes note of that sells Nightbane, which is a potion of some sort that takes away troubles and pain. And based on the way they describe it later, it seems like a magical opiate of some sort, because it sounds like it's really addictive. A man in the bazaar attacks her and she stabs him in self-defense, but the crowd sees her stab a guy and then chases her. <laughs> like, just an instant lynch mob forms. And then Grimm catches her and throws her in the dungeon. And that's that. And then we go to the present. And Oro says that there's a magical metal that can make weapons to fight Drex because their scales are really hard and it's hard to hurt them with normal weapons. But there is a magical ore that he knows about, which is awful convenient. And then a man named Zed appears, who is apparently an old friend of Oro, and he likes to steal and break into places. That's about all we learn about him, but, you know, he likes to steal and break into places. And then Isla, Oro, and the other rulers start uh, coming up with a plan to defend the island from Grimm and the Nightshades when they attack. Basically, they want the wildlings to cover a bunch of the island in thorns and poison plants to force the nightshades to attack in a specific spot, which is actually not a bad plan. It's not a particularly complicated one, but it's not a bad one either. But wait! The Skylings! We need the Skylings because they need to cover the air and protect them from the Drex because the Drex can fly around, and the Skylings might vote to leave because the Skylings are not a hereditary monarchy, they are a democracy. Even though if the island is destroyed, they will all die anyways. It doesn't matter where they are, they just, they'll die. So it's kind of dumb for them to vote to leave instead of trying to defend the island because without the, okay, whatever. The uh, contrived conflict really is the best kind of conflict. So Isla decides to go to this area called the Vinderlands to recruit people there. Were the Vinderlands mentioned before? Maybe, I don't know. All I know is that it's a place near the Moonling Realm, and the people there are not cursed. They're not part of one of the realms that were cursed. They're just different people who happen to live in this area. Isla starts training some more, and Remlar, who is helping to train her, tells her to kill a tree with her nightshade powers, and she doesn't want to, and she has trouble doing it, but eventually she manages to kill it, and then she uses the power from the tree to make a whole bunch of saplings sprout around her. So basically she's combining her wildling powers with her nightshade powers, which is ac actually kind of cool. You know, this, this scene does work. It's not amazing, but it does work, which is why I can't really hate Lightlark as much as a lot of other people do. Like there's, it has moments which are kind of okay. Like the idea of a character having power over death and power over life, and rather than distracting from each other or canceling each other out, they actually reinforce each other, that's kind of cool and it could be an interesting metaphor for something. This book isn't smart enough to do that, but you know, it could be. So then flashback again. Grimm says he needs some sort of magical sword. He doesn't say why he needs it. He just needs Isla's help in finding it. And then they go to a place guarded by a man who is called the Blacksmith, although Grimm also calls him Baron at a couple of points. And then he tries fighting them and Isla stabs him in the eye and he barely reacts to that. Just, okay, that's a thing that happens. Uh, and basically, the sword, whatever it is, whatever Grimm needs it, it has been enchanted so that no nightshade ruler can claim it. So that's why he needs somebody's help. And then Grimm takes the blacksmith's memories, uh, but the blacksmith doesn't know where the sword is, and neither do they. And later, also in flashback, uh, Grimm teleports into Isla's room, because remember, he can do that. That her, him and her are pretty much the only ones that can do that, from what I can gather. Uh, and he actually wants her to continue helping him go look for the sword. And the nightshades at this time are still cursed, remember, so they can't go outdoors at night. But Grimm has a charm which negates his curse, so he can go out at night no problem. Why doesn't everybody get a charm that can counteract their curse? No idea! Maybe they don't know how to make them and they're super rare? Maybe... I, I don't know. There's no explanation given at all. 
So they think the sword might be at a thieves base, so they go there to go check. Uh, some people attack them while they're there. Isla kills some of them and she's upset about it because she's never killed people before, but you know, Isla kills some of them because she's just so cool and badass. Grimm interrogates one of the thieves and actually cuts off his hand while doing so. He's, he's pretty brutal while torturing this guy. Uh, he finds out that a man named Victor might have the sword. So Grimm kills the thief after he gives him the information because he's an edgy emo bad boy that the main character is attracted to despite him being a fucking sociopath. Seriously guys, like there, there is a difference between bad boy and evil boy. A very, very big difference. So in the present, Isla goes to Moon Isle, and ever since the Moonlings left, the place is apparently a lot warmer than it used to be, which, okay, that's worth noting, I guess. Uh, and then they go looking for the Vinderlins, and a whole army of them appear in front of Isla. Which, remember, the Vinderlins is the name of the place, but the people from the Vinderlins are also called Vinderlins. It's a, it's a little weird, but, you know, that's a thing that happens. They try to kill Isla, but when they do... Uh, she actually touches the blade that they're swinging at her, and it turns to ash, and they're all impressed because they're like, Whoa, she's a nightshade and a wildling. That's so cool. Main character girl gets to be awesome and beloved without actually doing anything. She was just born this way. And they agree to help her if she helps heal some of them because they're having issues with magical sickness and injuries. In the past, she has a weird conversation with Grimm about painkillers and how he needed to get used to pain, so they like peeled skin off of his back to do it. it. Okay, sure, and also Grimm seems to be the one who taught her how to fight, even though she was taught by her tutors before, so I, I again, this book, these books just contradict each other all the time. I don't know why I'm even bothering to mention it when it happens. You should just assume that things are being contradictory when we're talking about Light Lark, but you know, that's a thing that happened. Anyways, they learned that the magical sword they're looking for is probably in, uh, this place on Nightshade called the Caves of Irida, and they're guarded by a monster of some sort. And then we go to the present again. In the present, the Skylings... I... I think they vote to leave? I'm honestly not sure. Like, I read this passage several times, and I'm still a little bit confused. Like, I think they vote to leave, but then there's some of them that decide to stay behind. If... if they were voting to stay or leave, but then some of them could just disobey, why did it even matter? I'm not sure, I don't know, just go with it, man. Uh, but yeah, I had to read that passage a couple of times. Sometimes you really just need a character to come out and say, yep, they voted to leave, because I'm sure this made sense in Alex Astor's head, but it doesn't m make sense in anyone else's. And also, Isla decides that she might turn the Starlings into a democracy later. Now, I'm not sure how she moves the magical curse, because, you know, again, this is a magical curse, which is supposed to affect hereditary monarchs. I'm not sure how they would sw change it from a hereditary ruler to an elected one, but okay, whatever. Zed also found the magical ore that the characters needed down in the mines, but he needs Isla to mine it for him because the main character has to be the center of fucking everything. Now, in the past, Isla and Grimm go to the cave where they think the sword is, and they, they see it, but it's being guarded by a dragon. And there's also a booby trap there that they trip, and it fills Grimm with like a dozen arrows. He's fine, but he gets shot with like a dozen arrows. And then, rather than continuing trying to get the sword, they just go to a ball which is being held at his palace because fuck it. You know, this, this book doesn't have enough balls yet. Just, just throw in some more, who cares? And while, while Isla is walking around at this ball, she mentions that there is, quote, music so loud and fast, it drowned out the moans she could hear when she passed by the dark halls, which, we get no other information about what type of music this is, but I like to imagine that this medieval palace, they're just playing EDM or heavy metal music, you know? It's just drowning everything out. Like, I just like the mental image of Grimm being a really big fan of Mastodon, you know? While they're there, somebody tries to roofie Isla. Like, they, they give her a magical roofie, and Grimm saves her from being magically roofied, which... I, I guess that is pretty much the only way you can make Grimm look good, is by comparing him to an actual rapist. So, you know, Grimm looks a little better than he did a minute ago. You would also think that this experience might, you know, change Isla a little bit. Like, you know, maybe she's fearful and paranoid for, around strangers from this point forward, but... No, it never comes back, it's just, hey, you almost got sexually assaulted, but you didn't, and now you're fine. Like, 
Again, that's the sort of thing that tends to stick with people. In the present, Isla makes some super cool armor for Lynx. You remember Lynx? Her magical black leopard that she bonded with? Like, yeah, I forgot about him until just now when I read about him in my notes. <laughs> so I don't blame you if you forgot. Like, he, he does very little in this book, but yeah, she makes some armor for him. He does nothing. He only exists to show that Isla is so cool because she has an animal companion. And other people don't. At this stage, we do get one reveal, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, we learn that everyone, th all their lives are tied to the lives of their rulers because one of Oro's ancestors cursed the people of Lightlark to prevent them from staging any sort of uprising. So if any ruler dies and they don't have any heirs, then everyone will die. And that actually is kind of cool. You know, that, that's a good detail. It, they probably should have mentioned it in the first book, but you know, it's, it's there. Now, a Skyling named Marin tells Isla that she is immune to curses and that she has also freed the wildlings and the starlings, which means that neither realm is tied to her life. Like if she dies, then the people in the wildling realm and the starling realm won't also all die. Uh, which is, again, something I'm not sure how he knows that, but he knows it and he tells her, or more accurately, he tells the audience because Isla doesn't do much with this. And in order to free the rest though, to free all the rest of the realms, Oro has to die. Again, I don't know how he knows this. I'm not exactly sure how this plan works, but he tells her, hey, we're going to have to kill the king uh, if we want to, you know, free everybody else from that nasty curse. And Isla does not agree to the plan because she doesn't want to kill the king. And then she leaves and nobody tries to stop her. Again, they just told her about this super secret plan to try and kill the king and they just let her go after she says, fuck no, I'm not being part of that. Like, that, that seems like a security risk to me, but I guess I don't know anything. In the past, we learn that Grimm only needs this magical sword because not only does it create Drex, like the flying creatures from the beginning, but it allows whoever wields it to control the Drex. Why we couldn't be told this from the beginning... I was, well, okay, I was about to say I'm not sure why we couldn't be told this from the beginning, but... I know exactly why we couldn't be told this from the beginning. We couldn't be told this from the beginning because, well, again, this whole book is just exposition. So if we just give the exposition, then that's boring and we don't have an actual book. We need to stretch it out and pad it out by pretending that there's some sort of plot and adding fake intrigue. Then back to the present. Grimm apparently has the sword in the present. We, we, again, we haven't found out how he got it yet, but he has the sword in the present and he kidnaps a bunch of wildlings and then tells everybody to surrender. And Isla decides that she's gonna try and cut off his powers using a love bond, which is a thing from the first book. It, again, it doesn't make much sense, but basically if you're in love with somebody who has different powers than you, then you can take their powers away temporarily and use them for yourself. Like, it, this is just a thing that exists in the world of Lightlark, because the world of Lightlark is dumb. And so there's multiple steamy scenes in the present between Grimm and Isla. In the past, they go to get the sword in, you know, the dragon's den, and it doesn't go very well. Isla nearly dies, and Grimm uses her powers, his powers to save her, and because he used his powers near the sword, the sword disappears, like it got transported somewhere else far away. And Isla's like, oh my gosh, Grimm, I'm so sorry, I messed this up for you. And he's like, yeah, that's okay, you're the main character, I'm not gonna actually be mad at you. And then she wanders in the woods for a little while and she finds a small dragon, a baby dragon, and then she gives it to him as a pet. In the present, Isla has finally mastered her powers and she goes to open the vault. And inside is a vision of Terra, who, her old teacher who was supposed to be dead. I'm not sure if this is an illusion or just like the spirit of Terra, or maybe Isla is just hallucinating. Whatever it is, Terra is there, and we get more flashback after that. So, after all of this, Isla is literally just wandering the woods, and then she finds the sword, just chilling there. And then she gets it, and gives it to Grimm. And apparently, even though the sword was cursed so that a Nightshade ruler could never use it, somebody else finding the sword and then giving it to them apparently broke the curse, which is a very easy curse to break. So now Grimm just has the sword and he can use it. That's, That's stupid! Use your common sense! And he explains that Lightlark, like the island and all the surrounding areas, was actually created a long time ago by people fleeing other lands. 
And when he says other lands, I think he means like other dimensions, other worlds that they had to get to magically, not people from like another island or something. Like this was magical. They came here, they created Lightlark. And if the portal that they used to come here is ever opened, then Lightlark will be destroyed. Uh, again, I think that's what's happening. Nothing in these books is explained super well or super clearly, but I'm pretty sure that's what he says here. Now, he mentions that uh, the portal is somewhere in the Wildling Palace and that only a Wildling ruler can open it. Why is that? Because the main character is a Wildling ruler, so obviously she has to be the special one that gets to do everything. And it turns out that the vault that Isla just opened was actually the portal and now Grimm is coming to take control of it. And again, remember, this is Isla just remembering something that was magically erased from her memory. If she had known this from the beginning, then she just wouldn't have opened the vault. Like, they would have already known what it was, and they wouldn't have done it. So, all of this, her only slowly getting her memories back, is not only really obnoxious in terms of, hey, the two different storylines are distracting from one another, and we keep switching back and forth, and we are learning all this information that we should have known way earlier, way late, because the author just doesn't know how to do anything here. Uh, on top of all that, this is the only reason that the villain's plan works at all. So after that, we just, the final battle happens. You know, like we just, the, the final battle just sort of occurs now. Uh, Grimm teleports his army into the middle of everything, which sounds like a shitty idea to me, but whatever. I suppose that doesn't matter because he's the bad guy. Bad guys do stupid shit and then they come really close to winning and then the heroes also do a bunch of stupid shit, but they manage to stop the bad guy at the last second because that's just that's just how that works. Uh, and then the Drex appear and the battle starts going poorly for the heroes and then Isla winds up cornered by Grimm. So that plan that they spent the whole book making, all the preparations that they were doing, the magical ore that they needed Isla to mine, that is all irrelevant. Literally none of that matters in this last bit. Like this all comes down to the main characters. The army plays no role in anything that goes down in the climax. And because the army plays no role in anything, everything to do with the army is just pure filler. Like again, the, the term filler is overused nowadays, but in this book it fits. Like I, I would honestly rather this book just be like 80 or 90 percent flashback than have all the present stuff be this irrelevant. You know, I, I would rather just spend most of the book reading about stuff that happened several years ago than switch back and forth between stuff that happened several years ago and is important and stuff that's happening now and is very unimportant. Like, that sounds better. Uh, and anyways, while Isla is cornered, Oro appears and he fights Grimm. Because even with a female protagonist that everything revolves around, only men can be strong enough to actually fight the villains. Especially if the villains are other men. Like, girls are only allowed to come in at the last second and give a final burst of magical power that saves the day. Because young adult fantasy is a very feminist genre. Now some Drex come and attack them, and Grimm can no longer control them for some reason. So Isla takes the sword and tells the Drex, Hey! You quit it! You stop that! And then they stop. And then she takes Grimm's powers, temporarily, through the love bond, and Oro is about to kill him, but it turns out that Isla is actually bonded to Grimm. Like, she just remembers at the last second, and he tells them. Which means that if one of them dies, so does the other. Like, like apparently... At the very end of the flashback, they were going to go to a place where some Drex were attacking, and apparently while they were there, Isla killed a bunch of people while fighting them, and we only hear about this afterwards in very vague terms, because again, the memories only appear when the plot conveniently needs them to. Also, Isla and Grimm are married now, apparently, and she only remembered now because we needed a plot twist at the end of the book. And he says that if Isla leaves with him and goes back to Nightshade, then he will call off the attack. And so she agrees to it. She tells Oro, hey, I love you, but I love Grimm too. And then she goes with him and the book ends. Like, that, that is it. That's where it ends. What the hell is that? I have done my best to make the summary of this book make sense, but it has required not only some thought on my part, but also some serious trimming, because there's just other details and other stuff in here which does nothing and means nothing at all. 
Like, the book is so committed to the slow drip flashbacks that every other chapter is a flashback. Like, you get flashback, then present, then flashback, then present throughout most of the book, even when there's nothing important there. Like, there's a lot of points where we get important flashback, and then important present, and then unimportant flashback, important pre present, unimportant flashback, important present, because Alex Astor was just so locked into the uh, going back and forth uh, every other chapter way. So this structure shoots itself in the foot because both plot lines distract from each other. Like every time there was something that kind of intrigued me, like again, Isla using her powers of life and death uh, to reinforce each other, every time there was something like that that was kind of cool, I wound up getting dragged away. It would honestly be better if we got like two or three chapters in the present, and then we got a flashback chapter, and then we got two or three more in the present and then flashback chapter. But even then, that wouldn't fix everything. It would just be an improvement. And even if we set all the flashback annoyances aside, there's no structure to this book at all. Like, neither of the storylines have any structure. The plot has no inciting incident at all. There's no falling action at the end. It just, again, it stops, like, seemingly in the middle of the climax. And the flashback storyline doesn't have a climax at all. We just hear about uh, Isla apparently killing a bunch of innocent people in the present in very vague terms. Like, most events in this book do not matter in the slightest. Like, the only important subplot is Isla learning about her powers, because that's what allows her to open the vault, but that turns out to be what the villain wanted all along. Now, I believe Lightlark is intended to be a trilogy, like, I, obviously that could change, and I don't think that's ever been confirmed anywhere, but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a tri trilogy, and if it is, it has the worst middle book syndrome I have ever seen in my life. Like, briefly, if you're not familiar with middle book syndrome, it's when the author knows how to begin the story, and they know how to end the story, but they're not really sure how to connect them. You know, like, you've probably read a couple of trilogies over the years where book one is the introduction, you know, this is where we are introduced to this world and these characters and we find out about the main conflict and then book three is some sort of big final battle and that leaves book two with a bit of an identity crisis you know like what is book two and a lot of authors have trouble figuring out what book two is and so oftentimes the middle book will wind up having nothing happen or it'll have a bunch of stuff happen but none of it seems to contribute at all and nightbane somehow manages to do both which is kind of impressive Alex Astor had more than a year to get this book out, and I figured at first that the extra couple of months she was taking was time she needed to rewrite stuff, but I guess not, <laughs> you know? And the thing is, I considered splitting this video into multiple sections, kind of like my fourth wing review, but I honestly didn't see the point. Like, do I need to explain to you that every character in this book is completely empty, or that the many fight scenes feature Isla doing weird and impossible stunts? or that she has zero chemistry with Grimm and Oro, or that Isla's dresses are given more description than any character appearance, or that there's no recognizable themes anywhere to be found. Like, I don't think I need to tell you that. I think you can figure that out on your own just based on, well, everything else I'm telling you. There's very little in Nightbane that surprised me. You know, the only thing worth noting is the depths to which the stupidity delves. Because again, it is occasionally very funny. And I think that's why the first book was huge, not for good reasons. A lot of people were just mad at it because it was not properly advertised and it didn't pander to them enough. But the first book was huge, and Nightbane doesn't seem to be huge so far. You know, it seems like it's just kind of come and already gone with very little fanfare. Like, that is... I don't know, that, that's a tragedy, in a way. Like, despite its success, Lightlark has very few actual fans. It connected with almost no one. Like, there is a fan wiki for the series, but there's nothing on it. Like, no one has added to it. It's completely dead. And I, before filming this, looked up to see on YouTube to see what other people are saying about Nightbane, and I've seen very few videos on it, and those videos have very little viewership. Like, it seems that Lightlark has not connected with anyone. It doesn't have much of a fan base. Now, I'll say right now, Lightlark is better than Fourth Wing. Like, the first and second books, that it's better than Fourth Wing. But Fourth Wing does have a huge fan base because it takes all of the boring story, 
world building, character development, it just shoves all that to the side in favor of making the self-insert protagonist effortlessly amazing so that she can go around and fuck hot dudes. Lightlark also has the effortlessly amazing protagonist who goes around and has sex with a whole bunch of hot dudes, but the books try to have an actual story and world building and stuff outside of that, they just really half-ass it. Whereas Fourth Wing zero asses it so that there's absolutely nothing to get in the way of the wish fulfillment. That is why Fourth Wing is beloved by the same people who should like Lightlark, but they don't. Because, it, again, it's just not pandering to them the way that Fourth Wing does. The only reason to read Lightlark is to laugh at the ineptitude, which is what I am doing. <laughs> like, the first two books are amusing. I've enjoyed laughing at them. And this may seem like a bit of a tangent, but bear with me for a few minutes. I think that's why we haven't seen very many successful screen adaptations of these really popular young adult fantasy books. Like, in the past few months I've covered three of them. I've done Red Queen, I've done Fourth Wing, and now I'm doing Nightbane, which is the second in the Lightlark series. Like, there are... these are all books that sold really well, and outside of that there's a bunch of other young adult fantasy stuff that has also sold really, really well, but we haven't seen any really big successful adaptations of them, which usually you get with really popular books. You know, like Red Queen came out eight years ago, it was a huge success in terms of publishing, but it had no adaptation. Same with Throne of Glass, it's even older and it's still, it, nothing has come of it yet. Shadow and Bone came out around the same time as these, and that was also a massive success, and it did get an adaptation on Netflix, but that was cancelled prematurely after only two seasons. Before that we had The Mortal Instruments and Vampire Academy, both of which got uh, big screen adaptations, which flopped, and so we only got the first book adapted, and then both of them came back later and had uh, television shows that tried to adapt the story, but those also flopped and were prematurely cancelled. Like, you could probably write an essay on why all of these books are connecting with audiences in written form, but they're failing to do so in visual form. However, my brief take on that is that a lot of them, and Lightlark and Fourth Wing are way, way worse about this than pretty much anything else I've read lately, but a lot of them are just self-insert wish fulfillment and there is literally nothing else to them. Like, there's no other story or anything there. Like, there's nothing to say about Isla Crown beyond her romantic entanglements and the power she gets just for existing. Like, she's completely empty as a character, that's why I'm not really going into detail about her. There's nothing to go into detail about. She is empty. She barely exists. And the world of Lightlark is complete nonsense. It has a little bit of effort put into it, like more than you would expect from something like this, but it's complete nonsense. There's nothing there. Like, these young adult fantasy novels are just isekai light novels, but they're aimed at girls instead of being aimed at boys. And just like isekai, they aren't just all the same. Like, they, they are all the same, but that's not just the reason to hate them there's also just nothing there at all. Like, again, if you are at all familiar with isekai, anime, manga, light novels, like, there is nothing to them. There's no character, no themes, and there's no story beyond the protagonist being awesome and being the center of attention. And stuff like Lightlark is exactly the same. And if that's all you ever have, then you're only ever going to appeal to a small niche audience. Even if that audience is very loud. But you can get away with it in the realm of books and light novels because books and light novels are really cheap and really easy to make. Television shows, movies, and anime are not. They need much bigger budgets, and therefore much bigger paying audiences, to justify their own existence. And that's why so many of these adaptations fail to get off the ground. Like, they can get a bit of an audience, but just not enough to pay for everything. That's also why these sorts of things get so much hate from people outside their target audience. Like, people gave me shit for criticizing Fourth Wing as harshly as I did, and they were going, oh, obviously, you only hate it because it focuses on romance, which, first of all, those people are fucking stupid, and they clearly didn't pay attention to the hour of complaints and criticisms I had about Fourth Wing. Secondly, those people and other fans of these types of things, whether, again, it's shitty young adult novels or shitty isekai light novels or whatever, like, if you're a fan of that sort of thing, you need to understand that this is pure wish fulfillment. That's all it is. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, at least in moderation, but you need to be cognizant of the facts, and you need to stop pretending it's anything other than what it is, because that's what's annoying, and that's what gets you hate from other people. Now, Lightlark is bad. Nightbane is also bad, 
but the author did something that none of her genre contemporaries seem to be doing, and that's that she tried. She failed horribly, but she tried. And that's why I just can't bring myself to hate Lightlark. As bad as it is, it is earnest. But that's also why it's funny bad instead of boring bad. You know, because there's energy and passion put into it, and that's why I'm gonna keep reading. You know, if there's a third book, I'll read that. If there's fourth, fifth, I, I hope not, but if there's fourth, fifth, sixth, I'll probably read those two, just because I am just happy that someone is actually trying, okay? Anyways, that's all I have to say. Uh, please like the video, comment, and subscribe. Goodbye. Hello, huge thanks to all of my patrons. You see these names here? Yeah, th these are my patrons. Uh, their names are very cool. You should sit here and read all of them. Especially a thanks to all of my $10 and up patrons, who are Oppo Savalainen, Olivia Rayen, Brother Santotis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Chibs Ahoy, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, Jalal Dalul, James M, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Microphone, Mistboy, Mitsimona, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych XS, Celine, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, Vimek, Zol, and Wesley. All of you, you're you're all amazing. I swear, all of you, you're you're great. And if you watched until this point, well, you're even more amazinger. So, yeah, uh, see you later. Goodbye. Like the video. Comment on it. Subscribe. Consider donating. Patreon. Why am I still talking?